Good morning. morning. How is the sound at the back? It's good? Okay. Everybody can hear. I'm getting a little feedback, though. Is it too loud? No. But it's it's, it's ringing back towards me here. I'm going to move this. uh... Okay. Anyway, good morning again. And it's good to be with you. A little story to begin with. A couple of months ago, I was speaking at a banquet. And, you know, at a banquet where they have the speaker speaking, they usually have you somewhere between the main course and the dessert. Okay, so people come and they're enjoying their meal and so on. At a certain point, they got to be interrupted by having to listen to a speaker. So anyway, the people were enjoying themselves at this banquet and so on. And the master of ceremonies came over to me and he says, Father, he said, would this be a good time to introduce you or should we let the people enjoy themselves a little longer? (laughs) Anyway, I'm here this morning. I want to talk to you about bringing God's consolation to a weary world. And I want to begin with, well, basically I want to do two things with you. I want to talk about um, the need the world has for God's consolation, but mostly I want to talk about what is God's consolation, bringing God's consolation to a weary world. And I want to begin with a story and an image, and then I'll go into that. A story, an image. This is the story. Right after I was ordained, which was quite a few years ago, um, in those years you still had to do an exam, which usually the bishop was supposed to administrate, but usually farmed it out to the moral theology department at the seminary, and it was called the jurisdiction exam. And you they gave you cases about what would happen in confession, and then if you did okay, you were credentialized to hear confessions. So anyway, I did this exam with maybe three different moral theologians, and then later on I got called in and I I made it. (laughs) Uh, But the major theologian gave me, I made it with some warnings, you know. So anyway, he told me, he says, you know, we listened to you and we, we have some concerns about you, uh, and the concerns are, they said, you know, you're, you're kind of a soft-hearted person and you're going to be too easy to people in confession. <laughs> and he said, that's not a good thing. <laughs> this man who later became a bishop was a great theologian. He said, look, he said, don't do that. He said, scripture says the truth sets you free. So no matter how difficult it is, you've got to lay the truth on because you're not doing people a favor otherwise. The truth will set you free. Hang on to that line. Less than a year later, I was in a rectory working for the summer, and I was there with an old priest who was partially blind, wonderful, saintly old man, almost 80 years old, and one night I'm sitting in the rectory with him alone, and his name was Leo. And I said, Leo, if you had your priesthood to live over again, would you do anything different? And I was fully expecting him to say, oh no, you know, I've been faithful and so on. But he surprised me. He said, absolutely. He said, if I had my priesthood to live over again, he said, I would do it very differently. He said, when I was in the seminary, they taught me, they said, look, the truth will set you free. You got it. (laughs) He said, and I've lived that. He said, I've been a faithful priest. He said, but I've been far too hard on people. He said, I've had my priesthood to live over again. He said, I would be much gentler next time, and I would preach more of God's consolation. He said, people are already carrying heavy, heavy burdens. He said, why are we laying all these burdens on people? Now, there isn't a contradiction there between my moral theologian professor and him. But the moral theologian professor is also right. The truth will set you free. Except the truth is precisely that we need to preach God's consolation. If we preach, truly preach scripture, there is no contradiction between the truth and God's mercy. Because the deepest truth is of a powerful, merciful God. Okay, that's the story. Now the image. Um, And the image is of scripture of Jesus praying over Jerusalem. They said one night Jesus was looking at the city of Jerusalem. He was gazing on his hometown, so to speak. And 
what did he say? He didn't say, well, God, what a cesspool and what an awful, secularized, terrible world. They said he cried over Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, would that you had listened to the prophets, would that you had listened to the messages that have tried to gather you in like a mother gathering her children to the table, but you won't have it. Those of you who are parents and struggle with kids and grandkids, you get the image, uh, which sadly oftentimes isn't the image of our church or churches. Today, far too often, we're looking at the secular world and we're saying, since you're not listening to God, go your own way and go to hell if you want. You know, we've got the truth and there you are. You know, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. You know, there's a famous story told when John Lindsay was mayor of New York in the late 60s. And um, at that time, New York City had all these problems, traffic, crime, this, bankruptcy, and so on. And it had all these problems that they said one Friday afternoon, just at rush hour, all there was traffic jams and horns honking and all this happening. And he was in a helicopter with some of the city council. And they looked down and they saw all this noise and stuff. And... um, Mayor Lindsay said, probably facetiously as a joke, he says, God, wouldn't it be wonderful if there were a plunger and we could just flush it all into the ocean? (laughs) (laughs) Too often, that's the way we look at our world now. That's not the way to look at it. We need to bring to this world God's consolation. And with God's consolation will come God's challenge. You know, with, don't put those in the verse. With, if we preach God's challenge, first, we're not going to have God's consolation. We need to preach God's consolation, and from that, we, you'll see, we'll bring God's challenge. So we need to do that. And before I'm going to some principles of how we do that, what we need to do, um, just a little, uh, another overarching image. You know the word gospel? There it's a, the gospel according to Luke, or the gospel according to John. We sometimes forget that the word gospel means good news. It doesn't mean good advice. It doesn't mean good morality. It doesn't mean good challenge. It contains that. But the word gospel means good news. When you take all of scripture, but particularly when you take Jesus, you will see that primarily what Jesus does is he reveals the heart and love of God for us. So Jesus said, you know, there's going to be moral instruction in there. There's going to be challenge. But mostly, Jesus is revealing, this is the God you're living under. And that's what we want to examine this morning. The truth sets you free. But the truth is that we are living under a compassionate, infinite, merciful, understanding love that we can't even begin to comprehend. And if we get that, we will get the consolation, and with that, we will pick up the challenge. But let's look at that. And again, I promise you, this is the last overarching image. Okay. I want to give you one <clears throat> overarching image of this, and that is the way Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe Jesus <clears throat> as the moment of his dying on the cross. You know, when you go to church on Palm Sunday, we always read one of the three passions, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Okay. And they all have the same, and you can, you'll remember this because it's a stark moment in the liturgy where the reader is, the lecturer is reading, and the lecturer says, and then Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then remember that we kneel down for a moment of silence. That's actually a very, very powerful liturgical moment. It's so stark, you know, that normally when you go into a church, you have a sense of the real presence. At that moment, you have a sense of the real absence. You know, Jesus has just died. There's something stark to that. You know, he bowed his head, he gave up his spirit, the real absence of God. And then you kneel for a moment and you get up, and these are the next lines. Then the Gospels say, Then the curtain veil was ripped from top to bottom, and there was an earthquake, and the graves opened up, and people began to walk around. The saints came out of the graves. Now, that's kind of frightening apocalyptic imagery, but
but actually it's very, very beautiful, powerful imagery. There's that the curtain veil was ripped from top to bottom. What was the curtain veil? The curtain veil was the veil, if you went into the Jewish temple, the time of Jesus, um, the people were in the, the main part of the temple, and then there was a huge veil which the people couldn't go behind. And behind that, you never saw him behind there, was called the Holy of Holies, and only the priests could go back there, and they would go back there to offer incense, but the ordinary people never saw into the Holy of Holies. They were separated by the curtain veil. Now what the evangelists are saying is, is the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ, what it does is it tears away the veil that separates the ordinary people from seeing into the heart of God. See, the cross takes away the veil and lets you see into the ultimate holy of holies, which is God's heart. And what do you see there? What you see there is spectacularly beautiful. You see unconditional love, which I'll talk about. We sometimes never experience that in our lives. You know, to really get this image, I want to just take it back and, and contrast it to the Old Testament image. In fact, last night at about 8 o'clock, if you went outside, there was a magnificent rainbow. Okay. See, in the Old Testament, the rainbow was the image, was an image for God and for God's fidelity. And actually, it's a beautiful image, although it's a physical image. And the image is this. See, God, Scripture says, God is light. Okay, in him there is no darkness. God is light. Now, normally you don't see light. This is one of the paradoxes. For instance, right now, in this room, we see, but we see by light, you don't see light. It's the interesting thing about light. You see by it, but you don't see it. Okay, now, you never see light except in one instance, and that is if you bring a prism into light. Now, what a prism does, it refracts light and it breaks it open. That's what a rainbow does. A rainbow is a prism. It breaks open light and you see the inside of light. And you see that inside of light is spectacularly beautiful. Like normally you don't see that. See, the prism tears away the veil and lets you see what's inside. Well, the cross tore away the veil. It's the prism that lets you see inside of God and what you see there is spectacular, moral beauty. God is love. God is infinite love, and so on. Now, let's break that. Let's unpackage that. And that's the consolation we need to preach to the world. And if we preach to the, the, the consolation, the world will begin to get the challenge. Let me give you a little psychological piece to this, which you'll get. You know, psychologists say this, and they're right. They say... Challenge is only effective, you can only hear it truly from somebody that you know loves you. You know, if you know somebody, you know, this person really has my goodness and my interest at heart, and they come and say, you know, Martha, if you want to look at that, you'll look at it. But if that isn't, if it's not predicated on that, somebody comes who you know doesn't love you, they just have goods on you. And when they challenge you, it just makes things worse. They're just putting your face into your sin, you know. See, so before the church and we as parents or whatever have any kind of credibility with the world, with our kids and so on, they first have to know that God loves them and God does. Let's look at that. I want to give you a series of principles. And since I don't know how long or how slow this is going to go, I'm not going to give you a number. I have 10, but we may not get to 10. Okay. First of all, the first principle that the constellation we're preaching is that God's insight, God's understanding, God's compassion, and God's forgiveness infinitely surpasses our own. Now, I'll illustrate that with a story. Some years ago, I went home to my own little small town in Saskatchewan. And I went home for a very sad occasion. It was a funeral of a young man who had been killed in a car accident. And we're a small community where everybody knows everybody and so on, mostly a Catholic community. And this young man who was like 20, 21, um, but he hadn't really been living <laughs> his Christian life as sometimes young people uh, don't do. 
So in the year or two before his death, he wasn't going to church. He was drinking heavily. He was living with his girlfriend. He was going to singles bars. He was doing things that aren't exactly Christian or moral. Okay. So one night he's drunk and he smashes up a car and he's killed. So the community gathers. We're burying this young man. And we all knew him. He was a very good-hearted young man. Okay. And afterwards at the reception, one of my aunts, wonderfully warm-hearted woman, she says to me, she said, you know, Father, she said, he was a good kid, despite what he said. He had a good heart. We all knew him. She said, if I were running the gates of heaven, I'd let him in. <laughs> now, you want to unpackage that. What was your fear? See, we understood this kid, and we understood, like, youth, and this is about young people, and so on. But she had the sense that God didn't. <laughs> See, <laughs> See, if only we were running the gates of heaven. See, we're, we're, we're much more understanding than God. Okay. <laughs> See, God has all this legalistic stuff he has to follow, and he hasn't got any choices. God has to put this kid to hell, even though he's got a good heart, because that's mortal sin and all that. Okay. Well, we can relax. God's compassion, understanding, empathy is a billion times beyond ours. God reads the heart. God can tell the difference between weakness and malice. God can tell the difference between immaturity and sin and so on. I mean, even we can. God does it a thousand hundred more times than we do. The safest understanding and hands we're in are in God's hands. You know, see, we always worry, well, this person committed suicide, or this happened, or God, we understand. You know, compassionate people. My aunt was a very compassionate person. Notice she was this strong Catholic who had this, you know, clear catechetical sense, and this was wrong, but at the same time, she understood this was a good kid, and our heaven needs to include him. You don't want this kid, you know, um, excluded from heaven because he was immature and was unlucky enough not to get through that period of immaturity. You know, had he, you know, lived a few more years, he'd probably be an upstanding, wonderful man, probably be a deacon today and so on. <laughs> no offense to the deacons, but, but you know, yet the misfortune of getting killed when he was young, you know, see, we get it. God gets it a thousand times more. So we need to preach that God's insight, understanding, compassion, forgiveness infinitely surpasses our own. Secondly, God is a prodigal God. See, so God is a really prodigal God. What does that mean? I'll give you an image. Jesus says, the sower went out to sow. And as he's sowing, some of the seed fell on the road, some fell in the ditch, some fell in the bushes, some fell into shallow ground, and then some fell into good ground. And some of it were eaten by the birds, and some didn't come up, and some got choked out with weeds, and some produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, I grew up on a farm. No farmer seeds like that. No farmer goes out and just indiscriminately throws seeds all over it. The road, the ditches, everything, you know. See, farmers try to sow the seed just into the good ground. Why? Because they have limited seeds. And seeds cost money. Okay? So you try to put it where you're going to get your best payback. But God has unlimited everything. So God is prodigal. You know, the opposite of prodigal is stingy, tight, so on. See, God is the most generous, prodigal, unstingy um, being that there is. Except God isn't a being, God is God. Okay. See, and we're living under this, and so we can make mistakes. Stuff can be wasted. And it goes on and on. God, God isn't stingy, God is prodigal. And we've got to preach that prodigalness of God. Okay. Remember that the story, and we call it this parable of the prodigal son. And that's an inept wording. It should really be called the parable of the prodigal father. See, who is really prodigal there is the father. 
the son wastes his inheritance. It doesn't matter. And you get the sense that he didn't impoverish the father. You know, a little joke on that. Since I heard this from a bishop, I can tell it. Okay. <laughs> And this bishop told me, he said, he did this inadvertently, but after it's realized it was a pretty good joke, you know. He said he was preaching on, in, a, in a church on the prodigal son. And he said, you know, the prodigal son took his father's inheritance. And he went off to a distant land and he wasted, pardon me, he went off to a distant land and he spent half of that money on prostitutes and drinking, and then he wasted the other half. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 You, good. Thanks. Thank you. You're alert. You got it. Okay. <laughs> but notice this father. He he runs out to meet the son. He doesn't say, well, you know, then we're going to have to, you know, look at what you wasted and so on. No. Bring out the fatted calf and so on. The, the father is prodigal because the father is generous and the father has unlimited mercy. You know, I teach at a theology school and our... Um, sacramental theologian, told me last year, he said, I've been teaching sacramental theology for 40 years. And he said, last year was the first time the seminarians asked this question in class. He said, he was teaching on the sacrament of penance. He said, their first question was, when do we have to refuse absolution? And he said, never. But notice, and these are good young men, but they're, they're so afraid, you know, what if we give away grace cheaply? Don't worry about it. The Father has infinite, infinite wisdom. And notice in the Gospels, God is always presented as prodigal. And that also prodigalness and largeness of heart and generosity are the way we imitate God. It's interesting in Luke's Gospel. Luke has the strongest social justice Gospel in Scripture. So Luke is hard on the rich, but he's not indiscriminately hard on the rich. In Luke's gospel, there are two kinds of rich. There are generous rich, and there are stingy rich. And God is hard on the stingy rich. It's okay to be rich if you're generous. God is rich. Heaven's going to be rich, but it's got to be prodigal. It's got to be generous. So we're living under a prodigal God that, you know, I've wasted it and so on. Just don't worry. God is a prodigal God. Thirdly, God is a God of complete nonviolence, non coercion, and non threat. The God that Jesus preaches is an invitational God, not a threatening God. I'll ask you this question. Um, in Scripture, there are more than 300 times where God appears. They call that theophanies. God appears more than 300 times, and in every case, what are the first words that are spoken when God appears? In an angel, in fire, in Jesus? Do not be afraid. See, when God breaks into your life, the first words are always, do not be afraid. If something literally rattles you in your boots, you can be sure it's not from God. God doesn't preach hellfire. God preaches grace. So notice, check it out. 300 times, once for almost every day of the year, God appears at, don't be afraid. A theologian friend of mine says, every time an angel appears, they always say, don't be afraid, which makes you wonder what they look like. <laughs> okay. no. don't, don't be afraid. See, when God breaks into it, it's always not fear. So God is never a threat. See, Jesus comes and he invites us. He doesn't threaten us with neurosis or with hellfire or whatever. God comes and invites us to live in a certain way, to move to a certain place, to become unparanoid. Um, see, see, God invites us, doesn't threaten us. Okay? Um, so God is never a coercion. Like, you know, sometimes people say, which is an interesting question, they say, why don't we preach hellfire anymore? You know, at least it's not preached much. And the, the, the thing behind the question is, say, because it's really effective. When I was a kid, when some of you were kids, the pre church preached a lot of threat and hellfire, and you know something? It was pretty effective. 
that if you don't come to Mass on Sunday, that's a mortal sin. And if you die that way, you're not going to go to heaven. Well, that's a pretty heavy-duty threat. We went to Mass. Okay. <laughs> and I remember the sisters had taught us when we were teenagers about, about sex. You, you were afraid if you ever even sneezed wrong, you were going to go to hell. <laughs> and you know something? It helped our behavior. So they say, well, if, if it's so effective, why don't we preach it? Well, brainwashing is effective too, but it's antithetical to the gospel. You know, the gospel is meant to set us free from fear, and especially free from fear of God. Okay, even though when we say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but that means reverential fear, not the type of fear of intimidation, of threat, of neuroses. You're not afraid of somebody you love. You're afraid of disappointing somebody you love. Okay, see, so God, it's, it's non-coercive. Michael Hines, who's a very fine theologian at Boston College, and he has this image of God. He said, you know, you, you know how you want to picture God? He said, have you ever seen a mother trying to, co- to, to teach a toddler how to walk? And they set the toddler against the wall, and they're kind of just a finger length, of, and they're trying to make this toddler take more steps, and they're coaxing him. And they're always, when this toddler takes a step, the mother moves back a little bit. That's God. It's a gentle, coaxing invitation to take another step. Now, inside of that, just as a footnote, there's also a complete nonviolence. Um, let me give you a story on this, and a powerful one. Because we somehow we always have God associated with violence. Okay? Um, and that is just a... Um, a powerful scriptural story which doesn't leap out at you. But one of the great scriptural stories on nonviolence revealing God's heart is the story of the woman caught in adultery in John's gospel. Let me run this story by you. There's about five homilies in this story. So John writes up the story. They say, one day Jesus was alone and a crowd brought a woman and stood him in the middle. Now, first of all, there's already a motif in there. In the gospels, okay, Virtually every time you have the word crowd, you can add the word mindless. <laughs> okay. See, Jesus is alone. When you're alone, you're a lot more reflective. When you're with a crowd, you're an idiot. You know, you're caught in hype and this and crowd. So a crowd, mindless, they bring a woman and they stand her in the very center. And the image there is, see, she can't get her back to a wall. They're shaming her. Okay. And they said, we've caught this woman in the very act of committing adultery. Then they say to Jesus, and Moses, see, Moses is the law. Okay, they said, Moses said we should stone women like that to death. What do you say? And scripture says, Jesus was bent down looking at the ground. So notice Jesus isn't looking at the woman. Very significant. They're staring at the woman. Jesus isn't looking at the woman. They said, Jesus was bent down at the ground and he began to write with his finger on the ground. They persisted, so Jesus turned to the crowd, not to the woman, and he said, let the person who is without sin among you cast the first stone, and he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground the second time. John said, then they all laid down their stones, and they walked away one by one, beginning with the elders. Notice, they came as a mindless crowd. They go home real sober. (laughs) They don't go home as a crowd. They go home one by one. Then Jesus turns to the woman, and he says, Woman, has no one condemned you? She said, Nobody, sir. He said, he said Go. Go. We're going to come back on that verb. Very significant verb. Go and don't sin anymore. Now, let's unpackage this story. They bring the woman to Jesus, and in John's Gospel, as you know, in John's Gospel, Jesus has no humanity. Jesus is divine all the time from the first line. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God and the word became flesh. So in John's gospel, you're dealing, Jesus is God. So they bring a woman caught in sin, and they bring her to God, and they say, Moses said women like that should be killed, stoned to death. Okay, what do you say? So Jesus is bent writing with his finger on the ground. What is he writing? Doodling? Memo to self? (laughs) Okay, no, it's not important what he wrote. It's important that he wrote with his finger. And it's important that he writes twice. Who writes with his finger? God. See, they were Jews. They would get the gesture. 
God wrote with his finger, and God wrote twice. And what did he write? He wrote the Ten Commandments to Moses. Okay, now, this is a great background to this story. Moses goes up the hill, the mountain, and God writes the Ten Commandments with his finger into stone. He brings them, and Moses carries them down the hill, and when he gets to the camp, he catches the people in the very act of committing idolatry. Notice there's only one vowel difference. They caught the woman in the very act of committing adultery. He catches them in the very act of committing idolatry. And what does Moses do? Moses broke the commandments. There's a powerful pun there. Moses got the commandments, and he was the first person to break them. <laughs> Except he broke them physically over people's heads. See, John wants you to get the... See, Moses stoned the people with the commandments. He stoned the people. He did violence in God's name, and it was wrong. And because he broke the commandments, he had to go back up the hill, get them written a second time. But before God wrote them the second time, he gave Moses a very strong lecture. He gave him this talk. He said, Moses, I'm not a God of violence. I'm not a God of vengeance. I'm a God of compassion. I'm a God of forgiveness. I'm going to write the commandments again. Take him down and don't be an idiot the second time. <laughs> but he didn't say idiot. He said, don't do violence in my name. Don't stone people with the commandments. Don't stone people with God's righteousness. And to the people's credit, they get it. They lay down their stones and they go home, sober. Then Jesus turns to the woman, very significantly says to her, go. Not just an ordinary verb. That is the verb that's used when the people are set free from Egypt. Let my people go. And finally, Pharaoh says to the people, go. So he's releasing her into freedom. It isn't just, well, get out of here. The episode's over. No, this, this is the new. These are the chosen people. He's saying to the chosen people, go. Go into freedom. You know, you're living in a different way because you're living under God. And then even in English, the, the, the other translation doesn't work very well. We said, and sin no more. But in Greek, basically the idea is go and don't miss the mark the next time. I'm setting you free. Go back into the promised land. Now, a couple of other little things about the text. Notice Jesus doesn't look at her in her shame. After she's no longer shamed, then Jesus looks at her. It's a wonderful little motif. See, God never looks at us in our shame. It's interesting when Adam and Eve sin and God comes down and catches them cowering in the bushes, and they're hiding because they've realized they were naked, and they kind of put leaves together to kind of hide, you know, cover themselves, and apparently the leaves didn't work all that well. God had to give them leather. And, and, and see, God even gives us what we need to cover our shame. God takes away our shame, and God never looks at us in our shame. It's a wonderful story, you know. But in, inside of that, the whole idea is God doesn't, first of all, look at us, in our shame, um, and we are, as people, we're not meant to preach and do righteousness in God's name. I'll give you one huge salient example of that. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little story here and see whether you can pick up the powerful irony in this story. Okay, I'm warning you, this is a very ironic story, and it concerns the English explorer Captain Cook. As you know, Captain Cook was not a Disneyland character, okay? <laughs> he was real. He came out of England, and he did sail the world. And at one point, he stayed in the Polynesian Islands for more than three years. And he learned the language, befriended the chief, lived at the chief's house, and he was keeping all these notes. And one day, the chief took Captain Cook to witness a human sacrifice. They were animus, and they killed people to the gods. So he took Cook to watch, and he killed this man, spilled his blood for God, and so on. And Cook, being a very sophisticated Anglo, um, was horrified by that. So he wrote in his diary, he said, I was absolutely horrified. He said, and afterwards, I told the chief, I said, that was terrible. He said, you're a primitive people. In England, we'd hang you for that. <laughs> okay. See, I'm, I'm glad you picked up the irony. 
We just call it capital punishment, or we call it abortion, or we call it something else. But capital, what is capital punishment? It's righteousness done in God's name. This person killed somebody, so we've got to kill this person. See, and remember, we're doing it for God. And you know, it's still all over. You know, you see today an in, in extreme example. You see that in extreme Islam, you know. You can be sure when they took the towers down in New York, the last words that went, that person said that they're plowing into the towers are, Allah is great. God is great. We're killing people for God. Couldn't be more wrong. Absolutely couldn't be more wrong. Okay. Then fourth, very importantly, we need to preach that God respects our nature. God respects human makeup and God respects our innate propensities. Not a small point at all. What does it mean that? Wait, so of course God respects our nature. We never quite get that. Let me give you an example. There's a great Hindu story. The Hindus have this story. Let me tell you this story. They say one day a man was walking with God, and they were talking, and they're walking on a road, and the man says to God, explain to me the meaning of life. And God said, I'd like to, except my throat is parched. So I want you to go get me a cup of water, and after I drink the cup of cold water, I'll explain to you the meaning of life. So the guy says, absolutely. He goes off to the nearest house, knocks on the door, and a very beautiful young woman answers the door. And he says to her, could I have a cup of cold water? And she said, absolutely. He said, but it's just noontime. Why don't you come in and, and have a meal first? So he enters the house, has the meal, 35 years later, okay, <laughs> they're married, they have five kids, he's a respected judge in the community, she's a respected member of the community, they have five children, and they're in bed one night when a terrible, terrible t uh, hurricane comes and it's just spinning the house, and in this terror of the tornado or hurricane, the man screams, God, God, where are you? And God answers, where's my cup of cold water? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. See, what you see in the story is a 35-year distraction. <laughs> you know, he really meant to do it. I was going to get a cup of cold water, but then he got distracted and married and this and so on. That happens. That's not a, 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 a big, chiding, scolding text. That's a text that explains human nature. It explains human makeup. We are just pathologically distracted critters. Why? Because we're made that way. You know, the fact that we're... Now, now, great spiritual literature always challenges us to you know, wake up, be more mindful, try to be aware of God's presence. And we never quite pull it off. We do it and so on, but invariably our nature pulls us back and we're immersed in life and your families and so on and raising kids and jobs and mortgages and Saturday night barbecues and all that and so on. Well, if that is the way we're built, and God built us that way, do you think that God is angry with us for living that way? You know, God made human nature. And he made it so it precisely it immerses itself very much into life. Well, if God made us that way, do you think God's upset that we can't always keep our conscious concentration on God? I want to read you a little piece that I wrote so, quite a while ago, but I, I want to read this because um, I, 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 want, I want to get this right. Okay. Uh, so I say, perhaps God is mature enough to not ask for our conscious attention most of the time. Perhaps God wants us to enjoy our time here, to enjoy the experience of love and friendship, of family, of friends, of eating and drinking, and even occasionally seeing our favorite sports team win a championship. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps God is a blessing old grandparent. Perhaps in an inchoate way, when we healthily enjoyed the gift of life, and perhaps, uh, pardon me, uh, per pardon, I missed something here. Perhaps we pray in an inchoate way when we healthily enjoyed the gift of life, and perhaps there are less conscious ways in which we are aware of God. See, God put us here to live human lives. And invariably, we're guilted. It's a, there's something wrong with me, you know. 
God asked for a cup of cold water 35 years ago and I've never got around to giving it. No, we're built that way. Um, and besides, I can put a footnote on, and we're also built horrifically complex. Let me tell you another little parable, okay? And I don't know if this comes from the Hindu tradition, whatever tradition, it's a good little parable. But see, there was a, a guru. So this this major holy guru, and different people would come to him for, and they wanted advice. So one time, three men came. And the first man came in, and he said, I want spiritual advice. And the guru said, well, I'll ask you a question first. He said, did you come here because you're really interested in growing spiritually, or did you come here because you heard I had a great reputation? The man said, well, I heard you had a great reputation. The guy said, well, I don't want to talk to you. He said, you're not ready for direction. Second man came in, and the guru said to him, he said, now, did you come here because you're really spiritually interested, or did you come here because you've heard I had a great reputation? The second man said, I came because I'm really spiritually interested. He said, you're not ready for direction either. <laughs> so the third man came in, he asked him the same question. He said, did you come here because you're spiritually interested, or did you come here because I have a reputation? The third man said, well... I came here because I'm spiritually interested and I heard you have a great reputation and because I'm kind of an addict to this type of thing and because I'm curious and because um, I want to get the experience, I want to get your autograph and your picture and, and, I'm, and probably a hundred other reasons that I'm not even aware of. And the guy said, you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's never pure, you know. You know inside of us, we, we, remember the great line from Thomas More, your martyr, Thomas More says, God made animals and plants to serve them in the simplicity and quietness of their being. So they made the human being to serve him in the uncanny reaches of our mind and the complexity of our hearts. We aren't simple people. And God made us that way. And, you know, we've never been able to, 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 to understand God in that way. We've Bluntly put, we've always thought that God's a little dumber than we are, you know, that we're complex and somehow God is upset with that. When God, in fact, built us that way, um, we are just as incredibly complex, pathologically complex people. There isn't any of us in this room who couldn't write two books on pathological psychology, just reflecting on our own lives. You know, I grew up in a, in a little country parish, a place just out in the middle of nowhere. It was a great place to grow up. And we'd always get these country, I mean, these priests, parish priests that come out. And I think they had watched too many episodes of Little Home on the Prairies, you know. <laughs> and they'd always come and say, you know, like, oh, it's wonderful to be with you simple farm folk. It's just so great and so on. And I always thought, little does this poor man know there are no simple farm folk. Because there are no simple folk. You know, we are just complex. You know, and our, and our, our nature is invariably driving us towards the material, towards our families, towards the football matches, towards everything. And that's not a bad thing. God isn't beating us up. See, God didn't make your nature one way. And now God is going to hold it against you forever that somehow you can't always have God as the center of your conscious attention. You know, Picture God more this way. You know, mature people, mature parents, mature grandparents, you know when they're happy? They're happy when the kids are happy. And when they're at the barbecue at the table, they don't have to be the center of attention. They're just happy when the kids are happy. God is mature. God is happy when we're happy. God is not saying, but you didn't think of me. Sure, you were at your daughter's wedding, and it went well. <laughs> but you forgot to pray. You didn't think of me. You know, No, God is happy when we're happy. Now, we have to try to think of God, but in the unconscious and the way we live our lives inquietly, there are deep ways of praying. There are other ways of being conscious of God. Now, fifth, very important. God doesn't demand certain moral conditions prior moral conditions to dine with us. God's presence is forgiveness. I can't emphasize that strong enough. God doesn't first demand that we meet certain moral conditions and then God dines with us. God dines with us before we meet those moral conditions. 
God's presence is forgiveness. Now, let me illustrate that in Scripture. Notice with Jesus. Jesus shocks and scandalizes people by, by dining with sinners, with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with the drug dealers of his time, and so on. And notice he dines with them. That's you, Christ. He doesn't first demand that they convert and clean their lives up. In fact, he dines with them, and then a lot of them do clean their lives up. But, you know, for centuries, we've tended to go in the other direction. First, you clean your life up. Then you can come to communion. Now, if I ask you this question, it's a trick question. Um, If I say to you, is it wrong to go to communion with a mortal sin on your soul? The Catholic Catechism says, no, it's a a sacrilege or even a more grievous sin to go to communion with a mortal sin on your soul. What's wrong with that question? Well, it's a hypothetical question. It's never going to come up unless you go to communion out of pure malice. But the very fact that somebody wants to go to communion is a 100% infallible sign that they're not in the state of mortal sin. Because you know, mortal sin means precisely we have cut, we have cut ourselves off from God. You know? So it's a hypothetical question. It doesn't exist. If anybody goes to communion sincerely, they're not in the state of mortal sin. And besides, the Eucharist is the great sacrament of reconciliation. And that's not new Catholic doctrine. That's already Council of Trent, you know. The Eucharist, the Christian community, is the essential sacrament of reconciliation, okay. See, you you don't go to communion after you've cleaned your life up. Communion is the way you clean your life up. You know, your great theologian here, generations ago, Ronald Knox, and I actually stole a, a line from him as a title for my book on the Eucharist, but I love this. Ronald Knox once says, you know, as Christians, says, we've never really been faithful to Jesus. In deep ways, we really haven't been faithful to Jesus. Said, Jesus said, we haven't turned the other cheek. We haven't forgiven our enemies. We haven't done the Sermon on the Mount and so on. He said, but we've done one great thing. He said, we've had one great act of fidelity, and that is the Eucharist. The last thing Jesus told us before he left said, keep the Eucharist going till I come back. And we've done that. We'll do it today. And he said, and that single act is going to save us. See, it, it's, it's our one great act of fidelity, you know. But notice the Eucharist, it doesn't demand that you first clean your life up. In fact, that's one of the tragedies today. So many people, don't, and some of your own kids, don't go to Eucharist because they don't feel worthy and they think they first have to get their lives cleaned up and so on. When the Eucharist is the way you clean your life up, you, you don't first clean your house, then call in the cleaners. You know, it's what the cleaners are for. The Eucharist is the great cleansing. It's the great sacrament of reconciliation. And uh, see, so Jesus comes and dines with us. There are no prior moral conditions. Notice Jesus Never, and he has to, he has to um, overrule the apostles. Notice with Jesus, the apostles are good church people. They're always trying to keep people away from him. Prostitutes, sinners, little kids, tax collectors. And Jesus is always saying, let them come. Let them come. And today the church, to our credit, we're like the apostles. We're always trying to keep people away. They're in a bad marriage, this, that. They're living with their boyfriend or girlfriend and so on. And Jesus says, let them come. There are no prior moral conditions to dine with Jesus. And even if we're maliced, notice Jesus gave Judas communion at the Last Supper. He didn't say the other 11 are getting a Judas. I know what you're all about. You can't have communion. See, Jesus gave Judas communion at the Last Supper. Jesus dines with sinners. There are no prior moral conditions. You know, great line. Some years ago when I was still living in Edmonton, and um, we had at our theology school, he was coming and redoing his degree, a Presbyterian minister with a great name. He was a minister called Billy Graham. Now, you can't get a better name for a minister. <clears throat> but unlike the biblical Billy Graham, I mean the, the TV Billy Graham, this guy had a wicked sense of humor and uh, had some pretty good insights. So he said he was in a store one day, and this young man came up to him and said, I know who you are. He said, you're the Presbyterian minister in Brayside. 
He said, and I belong to your church, but I don't go. He said, because I know the people who go there and they're hypocrites. Okay. So Billy said, well, you could come too. <laughs> he said, he says, always room for another one. Okay. But he said, you know, this is, that's not his best line. His best line, he said, young man, he said, I take that as a compliment, not as a critique. He said, I take that as a compliment. He says, I am running a church just for hypocrites. He said, uh, I don't even want people come if they're not hypocrites. Does it sound a little like Jesus? Jesus says, it's not the well who need the doctor. He said, I've come for those who are ill. I've come for sinners. Now I'm going to ask you another trick question. You know, Jesus says so often, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that converts than over 99 who have no need of conversion. So I'm going to ask you this question. Does God prefer sinners to righteous people? Does God like you better when you're a sinner? Seems to say that. Jesus says, there's more rejoicing in heaven um, over one sinner who converts than over 99 who don't have no need of conversion. Or in Luke 15, Jesus is describing God. He says, God is the good shepherd. He leaves the 99 in the wilderness and he goes after the one stray. And when he finds the stray sheep, he puts it on his shoulder and he rejoices over the one. He said, because there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that converts than over 99 who have no need of conversion. Now, what do you do with that text? Well, it's a tricky text. Okay. Does God prefer sinners to righteous people? No. It's a trick question because in, in Scripture, there are no righteous people. See, so it's not so much that there are sinners and righteous people. Nobody's righteous. There are sinners who admit they're sinners and sinners who don't admit they're sinners. And God loves people who admit they're sinners because we're all sinners. You notice in the Luke text, he doesn't say, the good shepherd left the 99 in a beautiful pasture and he went after the stray. He left them in the wilderness. They're no place. They're lost too. He goes after the one that acknowledges it's lost. See, we're all sinners. It's interesting, this is particularly strong in Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, you know, conversion isn't the precondition to become a disciple. The idea is not that I convert and now I become a disciple. Discipleship is a process of conversion. The whole Christian life is a process of living and accepting that we're sinners and receiving God's mercy. You don't first receive God's mercy. Now I'm a righteous person and I walk in God's light. You know, we're sinners walking in God's light. Okay. Now, um, seventh or sixth, God is complete, trustworthy, faithful, and self-surrender. Okay. You are never in safer hands than in God's hands. Use a strong example. Uh, as a priest, I'll sometimes, and not, not, these aren't the easiest days of your life for you. You have to preach at the funeral of somebody who died very young. A child, you know, or somebody who dies in an accident. Somebody who dies where they, they still need a mother. They still need a parent. You know, like, uh, it's one thing if you die at 90 or whatever. It's another thing if you die at 9, you know. And see, so this young person dies who still needs mothering, still needs, and so on. And it's difficult preaching. I always give this homily. I see, you know, it's... This young person still needs a mother. This young person, you know, they're, they're not ready to. I said, but they're going into the hands of a mother. They are going to land in far gentler hands than they were on this side. You know, that in God's hands, we're, the safest, we're in the safest, gentlest hands that we have ever can imagine. You know, sometimes we have spiritualities, uh, and I grew up on some of this, that they, they, they give you this, this frightening perspective of what's going to happen at the moment of death. See, at the moment of death, you have to face the truth. And you're going to be facing this scourging, judgment, and so on. What's wrong with that perspective? Well, it's going to be a judgment of love. You know what's going to happen at the moment of death? You're going to meet the most um, unconditional love that you have ever met. You are meeting God. God is unconditional love, and so on. You're going to meet a love like you've never met on this side. You don't have to be afraid of death. 
And that's why the mystics, the great mystics, John of the Cross and the Carmelite mystics, they say they looked forward to their death. They said, this is, the, this is going to be the first time you truly meet love. And it's going to be an ecstatic love and so on. So it's not, you don't have to be afraid of meeting God. God is the one person you never have to be afraid of. God is the one person you can always completely trust. You're not going to meet some searing um, type of judgment. You're going to meet some searing love. John Shea was a very good theologian. I love this line. John Shea says, you can take this line to the bank. John says, hell is never a surprise waiting for a basically happy person. You know, get that? Hell is never a surprise waiting for a happy person. You're not going to live a life like you. And you get to in front of St. Peter, and he says, you know, I've looked at your dossier, and we've run it through a computer, and, um, you know, um, I know you're happy now, but I've got a surprise waiting for you, you know. <laughs> okay. Hell can only be the full flowering of a basic life of alienation and anger and just uh, uh, and bitterness. I've got a question. Do you know, you know who Johnny Rotten is? Okay, Johnny Rotten is, is the leader of the Sex Pistols. And some years ago, and I saw this. He did an interview in the New York Times. And in there, you know, of course, he's probably playing a role. But anyway, he says, you know, I've always been angry. I'll always be angry. I hate the world. I hate everything. I, I'm just this angry person. And don't try to tell me I can ever be happy or stop hating. Okay. I thought, if there's anybody in hell, it's because a statement like that might be true. You get it? See, you know, if any of you died today, you'd go to heaven because you want to go there, you know. Remember when Thomas More was being executed and this, this uh, bishop was there and, and uh, Thomas More says to his executioner, he says, you know, I forgive you. He said, and don't feel bad. He said, you're sending me to God. And the bishop said, are you sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> and Thomas More said, God will not reject anybody who comes to him that willingly. It's a good line. See, God will never reject anybody who comes to him willingly. If any of you died today, you'd go, you'd go to heaven. Okay. Uh, because you want to go to heaven. If you feel like Johnny Rotten, say, I'm angry, I'm hateful, and I'll always be hateful. <laughs> uh, God could say, well, while you're in that state of mind, you're going to have to wait outside. Okay. Because um, we can't have that in heaven. Okay. God is completely, completely trustworthy. Okay. Um, l lastly, and then God, and this is the ultimate consolation. We're living, we preach God's consolation. We are living under a God and a Christ who can and will descend into hell for us. You know, in our creed, we have this cryptic line that says, he descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. What does it mean that God descends into hell. Okay, now we have our icon, catechetical thing of this, that after Adam and Eve sinned, the gates of heaven were shut, and then Adam and Eve and Abraham and Sarah and Rachel, they all had to wait in this place in the underworld. Then when Jesus rose from the dead, he went to that place and took those souls and went into heaven. Okay, um, that's our catechetical, iconic understanding. Okay, there's a spiritual understanding which goes right back to the church fathers and Gregory of Nyssa and, uh, until today, and it's this. They say this is the most consoling doctrine in all of religion. What does it mean that God or Christ descended into hell? I'm going to give you three images, discrete images, and afterwards you blend them and you'll get this. Okay, first image, and you can write your own. Some years ago, some family friends of mine, they had a daughter, 21 years old, who had had a history of clinical depression, a severe clinical depression. And at one stage, she attempted suicide. And so they brought her home, and for the next three months, they gave this young girl the best love they could do, the best medicine, the best psychiatry. They took her to their counselors. They took her to their group therapy. They took her every place, and it didn't help. She killed herself. She had got into some private space, some private wound in hell inside of her heart, that no human being, psychiatry, medicine, love, could touch anymore. Okay, close that off. Okay, now, 
in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, you have a very famous painting by Holman Hunt, the painting about the Christ who knocks. And you've all seen a lot of knockoff paintings on this. But remember, it's, it's the, the, the holy card, the original is in St. Paul's Cathedral in, in London, and that is where Jesus is standing outside of this huge oak door, you have a man, and this man is huddled behind this huge, thick oak door in some kind of darkness. And uh, Jesus is standing on the outside with a lantern, knocking on the door gently, and, but there's only a doorknob on the inside. So the whole idea is Jesus would like to come in, but he's got to open the door. Okay, close that. Okay, last image, John chapter 20, the resurrection account in John's gospel. They say in the morning of the resurrection, all the disciples were huddled in a room with the door locked for fear of, out of fear. He said, and then Jesus came, notice he doesn't knock on the door. They said, Jesus came right through the locked door, stood in their midst and breathed out. And he said, peace be with you. Don't be afraid. I say it again. Peace be with you. Now, melt the three images. You can be sure when this young woman who died of suicide, when she woke up on the other side, Jesus was in the middle of her fear. That shell that no human being could penetrate anymore and say, peace be with you. See, what, what the doctrine teaches us, and it's the most consoling doctrine in all of religion, Christianity and every other religion, and that is when we can no longer help ourselves, when we get into shells of wound, of bitterness, of anger, of alienation, in which no human being can penetrate anymore, Jesus can still get there. See, that's the love that Jesus shows in the crucifixion. Jesus can penetrate any hell we can create and breathe out peace. Now, if we respond to the peace, we go to heaven. You know. In fact, Gregory of Nyssa, who first helped formulate that, he was a universalist. He was a great saint. And Gregory of Nyssa believed that eventually the final triumph of Christ is going to be when Christ empties hell. He said, when even the devil converts and goes back to heaven. He said, that's going to be the final conversion, uh, the final triumph that the love of God is so strong that eventually even the devil will convert and go back to heaven so that hell will be empty. Now that's Gregory of Nyssa, believed that eventually God will do this. But this is this great consoling doctrine, which means it's never, ever lost. There's none of us in this room who have been on this planet for a very long, long time who haven't lost loved ones and haven't lost and seen people lost in, in hopelessness and suicide and alienation and bitter breakups and anger and wound and so on, from which this side of eternity, there is no coming back, you know. But... Um, when we're out of moves, there's still one great move. We are living under an incredible, compassionate God. See, and that's the truth we have to preach to the world. The truth will set you free. Okay? Now, so there's no contradiction between mercy and truth. We need to preach this truth, but it's the truth of God's mercy. And you know, Jesus did that. I noticed Jesus he would go and dine with sinners and preach this, and then they would convert. You know, you have this thing about new evangelization. I think new evangelization is not so much going to be a technique. It's going to be trying to get through to our own kids God's infinite mercy, the God they live under. A lot of people, you know why they don't go to church? Because they got a wrong notion of God. You know why there's so many atheists in the world? Because they have a wrong notion of God. Michael Buckley, the American Jesuit who's written the most eloquently on, on atheism I've ever read, and Michael Buckley says, all atheism is a parasite off bad religion. You only have atheists because we preach God wrongly. Okay. Um, that, that's, that's the consolation we need to preach. Okay. Um, let me end with, no, this is, I'm, 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 I'm getting the signal. <laughs> So anyway, it's been wonderful being with you. Thank you for listening so attentively. Thank you.